Uh, I'm going to log off for a minute, Mr. President, and try and log back on, on another device. I'm having a little bit of difficulty. Sure, sure. Recording in progress. So, good morning. Unmute, unmute, current, whatever. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Good morning. Assalamualaikum. Good morning. Sorry, sorry to disturb you on a Friday, but thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, how, how, how are you doing now? It's good. I'm okay. Post-COVID no, uh, no, disturbances we do have, but I'm getting better. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Matuba Well done. You're doing well, mashallah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Exciting. Uh, our Honorable Chief Guest and our special guest, as a, also our guest of honor, is already here. And many of the speakers have joined as well. So, at the very outset, with the kind permission of today's Chief Guest, uh, sir, may I start? Please. Thank you, sir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Today's Chief Guest, Mr. Muhammad Tafazal Hussain Mia, Secretary, Prime Minister's Office, Government of Bangladesh. Special guest, Ms. Fatima Yasmin, Secretary of Economic Relations Divisions, Ministry of Finance, Government of Bangladesh. Guest of Honor, His Excellency Ito Naoki, Ambassador of Japan to Bangladesh. Respected discussants, ladies and gentlemen, friends from the print and electronic media. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. I would like to welcome you all to the discussion, a session of the day four of Bangladesh Trade and Investment Summit, which is titled Asia Pacific and Bangladesh Harnessing Economic Potentials. Uh, Bangladesh Trade and Investment Summit 2021 is jointly organized by the Ministry of Commerce and Akka Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which was inaugurated by the Honorable Prime Minister of the People's Republic of Bangladesh on 26th October 2021. We are thankful for, to today's uh, chief guest and special guest and guest of honor and all discussions for their kind presence, even on a weekend. Um, at the, for many of you who were able to attend the inaugural ceremony, we have heard the Honorable Prime Minister in her inaugural address, how she has been very vocal about export diversification, market diversification, and product diversification. And the role of the, the active role of the private sector, which will help drive the economy to the next level. So, as you already know that the economy of Bangladesh is growing gradually and doing better than its regional peers. Bangladesh is now considered to be one of the fastest growing and resilient economies in the world. And according to the IMF, the economic growth remained positive despite the pandemic shocks backed by growing international trade. But our export business is a critical game changer and our growing regional and global uh, economic relations and we also know that Bangladesh heavily relies on the ready-made garments for export growth. And RMG itself accounts for 84% of our merchandise export. And Asia Pacific 
the region itself is the third largest destination of Bangladesh, export destination of Bangladesh, and we have received significant amount of foreign investment from Asia and the Pacific region. Um, this economic relation has developed over the past years backed by friendly diplomatic ties. There are many issues, challenges which exist, which need to be addressed to create more economic opportunities and exploit our potential in the years to come. In this connection, with your kind permission, I would like to make a very, very brief presentation, uh, which will help you um, set the tone of today's discussion uh, about the region, which is much talked about. And we believe the emerging tigers are all residing in Asia. So. Ladies and gentlemen, I would request you to kindly view my presentation. I hope it's visible for all. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you. So as I mentioned, today is day four of the session. And initially I will just go to a quick overview of the economy, which Many of us are aware of, even the whole world is talking about it. Bangladesh has reached a $355 billion GDP with a per capita income of $22.27. We have a stagnant inflation rate and the contribution of industry, agriculture and service sector to GDP has seen substantial rises. And reserve, of course, the consistent foreign reserve hike. Uh, this year has been the highest of 48.6 billion. Our import has seen almost 20% growth and double digit export growth, which we have always mentioned 15% just in the year 2020 alone. Now the cause of success behind Bangladesh economy, of course, 2026 is the year we are currently looking forward to upon the graduation of Bangladesh to a developing economy. And at the same time, according to the Economist magazine, the ninth strongest economy has been, uh, Bangladesh is the ninth strongest economy uh, as rated among the 66 emerging economies. <clears throat> digital Bangladesh has been also a game changer. In fact, the success behind this summit is also the result of Digital Bangladesh, which started, which was a revolution started by the Prime Minister back in 2008. And 67.39% is the internet penetration. We have covered 97% of the electricity. Our multimodal connectivity, as you know, the 10 meg various uh, mega projects, which is going to lead Bangladesh to uh, regional uh, integration. And at the same time, our poverty reduction has seen almost 6%, uh, sorry, 4.1% from 2016 to 2020. And needless to mention, Bangladesh has been maintaining a stable credit rating in the past and is currently doing so. As for the economic relations of Bangladesh and Asia Pacific, the bilateral trade between the two regions hovers around $36 billion. And the APAC is the largest import source in country, accounting for almost 50% of the total trade. And of course, the third largest export destination of Bangladesh. As for trade, we have seen our exports reduce slightly from 1819 to 1920. And, but similarly, our imports have gone up from 31 billion, from 30 billion to 31 billion. This is, you'd consider just the post COVID effect. <clears throat> As for FDI, we can see that uh, Bangladesh in the year has seen major investments coming in. Uh, from Singapore, China, Hong Kong, India, Korean Republic, and so on. And major export and import products. Primarily, as we mentioned earlier, the major export item from Bangladesh primarily is the apparel and the RMD sector has been leading, followed by footwear and leather goods, and then agro products, pharmaceuticals, and plastics. As for imports, we have a dependent electronic, electrical machineries, mineral fuels, iron and steel, and organic chemicals. Sectors that Bangladesh has been attractive for the investments coming in from the APAC region primarily is food, agriculture, fisheries, chemicals, gas, petroleum, the textiles and apparels, leather and pharmaceutical products. We do have uh, investments in leather in Bangladesh from APAC region, uh, cement construction, telecom trading, insurance, banking and, and BFIs. Now the challenges, the incidence of the non-tariff measures, they still remain high, including strict and technical testing standards. At the same time, the complex rule of the APTA is often impaired trade and the growth of SMEs in the value chain process. APTA offers lower preferential rates for the LDCs that hold back our current trade growth and the regional economic blocks like RCEP prefers member-centric trade and challenges of uh, access to Bangladesh to larger market share. Bangladesh does not have any PTA and FTAs with the Asia Pacific and the member countries. Now, the way forward, the comprehensive study and the regional economic dialogues are required to address the NTDs 
more bilateral and uh, multilateral agreements are needed to be made to tap the untapped markets of the Asian region. At the same time, the rules of origin need to be relaxed by APTA for the export growth from LDCs. We still have time to, to graduate, and at that point of time, it needs to be uh, severely addressed. And Bangladesh can be included in the RCEP for reducing imbalance of the APAC countries for a comprehensive free trade agreement. But I must also share that, of course, the government right now is heavily working on the RCEP, and they are very much interested to sign in the process. At the same time, uh, cross-border paperless trade is in progress, which needs to be expedited for cost and time efficient trade growth. Uh, Bangladesh and Australia signed a trade and investment framework arrangement, which needs to be expedited for trade and investment growth. A dialogue on BIMSTEC FTI deal are needed. FTA deal are needed to progress for more regional economic integration. Opportunities for investment in Bangladesh. The BCIM corridor is one of the most potential route and the gateway to the ASEAN region and beyond. And the duty-free quota free access of our products to New Zealand, Australia, Japan, and other developed countries provide a competitive edge to investors in Bangladesh. And Bangladesh always favors regional integration and action to go for more PTAs and FTAs, which both the Ministry of Commerce and the Foreign Ministry has been working on uh, for the possible export growth post-graduation and growing liquid energy import by Bangladesh creates LNG and LPG trade opportunities for enriched APAC countries. Uh, that was the end of my presentation. I hope uh, I wasn't too long. At the very end, we will go right into the discussion. And at the very outset, uh, we have today with us Dr. M. Masur Riaz, He's the founder and chairman of uh, Policy Exchange of Bangladesh. And uh, I will just pose a question to him. Uh, that As a private sector think tank, uh, focusing on applied public policy and market solutions for economic growth. We want to learn your thoughts on what kind of policies need to be formulated, reformed and revised for a smooth and friendly market in the Asia Pacific region. Also, I need to mention that in our export basket, as I repeat, told you earlier that the Prime Minister has been talking about market and diversification. At the same time, our export basket in the APAC region is only 11% of the total exports. So what needs to be done? And this will also help you set the tone of the dialogue as we move on. Dr. Masuriyas. Thank you, Mr. President uh, Rizwan Rahman. At the outset, I'd like to congratulate Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and Industries, DCCI, and the Ministry of Commerce for initiating and holding this very timely and uh, very uh, effective event, uh, Bangladesh Trade and Investment Summit, as the world and certainly Bangladesh economy is recovering or poised to recover fully from the COVID uh, effects as Bangladesh prepares to uh, latch on to greater prosperity and opportunity beyond 2026 uh, out, out of the LDC uh, box. I think this sort of events will provide the analysis, strategic direction, and bring together all the important stakeholders uh, for common goals. So I congratulate uh, both the organizers of this summit. And thank you for having me. So today's chief guest, uh, Mr. Uh, Tofazal Hossein Mia, uh, Secretary, Prime Minister's Office, special guest, my uh, distinguished fellow panelists uh, and distinguished participants, Salam alaikum, and a good morning to everybody. So to respond to Mr. President's uh, uh, very important question, I would, uh, one would really have to first understand the inherent strength of Asia as the we have seen in the past, as we see at the present, and how it's going to evolve in the future. And that actually would unearth and, and shed light on the implications for emerging economies like Bangladesh in terms of what sort of economic gains we can actually expect to uh, uh, attain from Asia Pacific and what strategies will have to be deployed. So why Asia Pacific? Uh, we all know about the Asian century or the Asian era that has already started. It's no longer a game of the future. Uh, the fundamental strength of Asia Pacific, if you look at, at some of the very fundamental uh, 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 pillars that makes Asia Pacific uh, the region of the present century and perhaps the next century as well as an economic powerhouse. Uh, there is no greater asset in the world than the world's uh, human being. And the 60% of the world's population live in this continent. And it is uh, perhaps by far the youngest continent of the, of the entire globe. And it will remain so for the next uh, at least several decades. 35% uh, of the global GDP contributed by Asia Pacific alone. There are six continents 
but one third at least of the global GDP comes from this particular region. Uh, Asia Pacific's GDP overtook the entire global GDP by 2020, 2019, in fact. Uh, but uh, is that is that a sudden miracle or is that a sudden success? Certainly not. The Asian miracle, the century of Asia, has actually been founded back in 1950s when the first of the six uh, economic boom that the entire world liked to have started through the economic boom of Japan. Actually, uh, the, there are uh, five, I would say there are five uh, very uh, talked about, much analyzed and extremely productive economic booms that took place in this region or Asia is the site of the largest number of longest service economic boom, the Japanese miracle, 1950 all the way to 1990 and still continuing as one of the most prosperous productive economy in the, in the world. The Han River uh, miracle in Korea, starting in 1961, continuing its uh, the growth, uh, you know, uh, miracle till 1996, and from then on, you know, reaping the dividends for themselves and for the region. The economic boom of China pretty much started in 1978 and continued till 2013, and again the prosperity continues. The tiger cub economies boom, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Phil uh, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. 1990s, it continues through today. India boom, 1991, continues through today. So at the side of the largest number of booms, which is persistent over the longest period of time, what better continent than that, that Bangladesh has in terms of deepening its economic ties to trade and investment in the coming, coming decades. But if you look at the future, what, is, what does it hold for Bangladesh or for the global economy? By 2030, 60% of the entire global, global growth is going to come from Asia Pacific. Uh, and by 2040, 50% of the GDP, which is currently 35, 36%, is going to be from Asia Pacific. And the entire continent is going to become the epic center of the consumption uh, driven economy that we have seen in the North America and the Europe for last almost one century, making them the center of global economic uh, attention. 2.4 billion new people will join middle class for consumption economy, for export-oriented, uh, uh, export-led growth economies. Middle class of destination economies or target economies are extremely important. 2.4 billion new people will join the middle class over the next 10 years. 90% of them, a whopping 90% of them are going to be from Asia Pacific. So if you're looking at the market, which is going to increase, where is it? None other than the place where 90% of the new middle class are going to be in. Uh, shifting the focus from there to, you know, a, a layer which actually drives the, uh, you know, economic ties at an, at an sort of, uh, you know, applied level, the, the farms, the corporations, or the private sector in the Asian economy. So we have seen the century of uh, North American multinationals, European multinational. I think the multinational corporation era for Asia have all already start, started. Uh, or we are calling it the rise of multinational uh, Asia. 140 of the unicorns, as you know, the unicorns are the companies which are valued at least a billion dollar or above are currently in Asia. China in the whole world now has the highest number of patent in artificial intelligence and deep learning, which is going to actually, both of these are going to determine the way manufacturing services infrastructure in many cases are going to be uh, uh, going to evolve. Uh, we see global leaders coming up from Asia in different sectors. We have seen the Japanese leadership in automobile industry over the last few decades, electronic industry. Now we see Huawei in technology, the Singaporean DBS in banking, Unicharm and Kao in personal care, Santora, Universal Rovina in food and beverage industry, and there are many more. Uh, now, what does it mean for a country like Bangladesh, which is aspiring to deepen its economic, already very successful, look, you know, economic success, uh, banking on uh, expansion of export, uh, banking on an export-led growth strategy. Uh, if we look at, uh, you know, the entire Asia Pacific, it's home to many regional trading and economic blocks. And what we have learned through our RMG export to European Union, this 
economic blocks or these trading blocks, they actually serve as a great catalyst, a strategic catalyst for a country like Bangladesh to actually uh, enhance its export many times. We have ASEAN, 10 countries. We have Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is security, but also economic. Many people tend to forget. And it's a, it does have India and Pakistan in that, as well as China and several other countries. We have recently launched RCEP, 10 countries who are going to have hundreds of billions of dollars of trade among themselves and with Asia. And then we have APEC, which is Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. This uh, whole, uh, you know, this country building on this economic growth, all these countries are actually going to the Asia Pacific countries. They're, as I say, uh, they're becoming the center of consumption. And as a result, a great lucrative target for export uh, oriented economies such as Bangladesh. Just to give you an example, how consumption is taking place uh, or increasing its share in those economies. China, over a decade, between 2007 and 17, they have tripled their overall production from uh, production from $3.1 trillion to above $8 trillion, okay? It's a 300% production increase. But at the same time, China's share of export out of its total output has gone down from 15% to that of 8.3%, which denotes that the Chinese economy is using more of its production and outputs for its domestic consumption, just as we are for our tea industry. And we'll hear more from Barrister Niyat Kabir, who actually uh, knows so much about that. Uh, so China, we have an aging population, but they have rising wage, urban migration, service jobs increase, and drop in savings rate. This is going to increase consumption. India has demographic dividend and a rising middle class. And the carb, carb econ, tiger cub economies, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, Thailand, labor force is expanding, and so is their disposable income. So all together, they hold a great prospect for Bangladesh's trade potential. Uh, just to give you some example, uh, where, where do we stand? Uh, the, and in some of the high priority sectors that we have, already or we have identified for the future. RMG, the Chinese domestic market, is uh, you know over uh, $300 billion. Bangladesh's export at the moment is $590 million with an M. Uh, India is $75 billion. We uh, export about $399 million. Singapore is $27 billion. We export $196. Japan is $97 billion when we export about a $1 billion. And that's in the most successful sector we have. So you can see what uh, the prospect is, how much more we can do. Uh, leather and footwear, we have uh, esteemed panelists, Mr. Nassim Manzoor, who will speak more, I think, about that. Foot footwear, uh, 30, you know, the Chinese, uh, uh, the Indian market is $9 billion and we export about 16, $17 million to, to that country as of 2018, 2019. Singapore uh, is $800 million of footwear and we export about $4 million. Uh, Japan, uh, almost, I have the yen number, I, I think uh, the dollar would be something almost uh, in few billions, almost 313 billion yens, and we export about $45 million. Electronic machinery, China, $100 billion of import, despite they being a largest producer. Bangladesh exports to China about only $4.8 million uh, of elect electrical and electronic uh, uh, good, including machinery. India's import is $372 billion. Bangladesh exports around $6 to $7 million. Uh, again, Singapore, $27 billion Singaporean dollar, out of which uh, $4.77 million comes from Bangladesh. So this, all of these are, are giving us a, a sort of a clear understanding in terms of where Asia stands as an economic energy hub, where Asia is going to be in the future, and how the economic uh, realities are going to change with implications for Bangladesh and where does Bangladesh stand in terms of what they need, what they need, what they import, and how much Bangladesh actually can take uh, import uh, export uh, currently and how much it can export in the future. If you come to FDI, another strand of the of, of the economic ties, uh, Chinese FDI 2019. In if we look sect, uh, so overall. Uh, 2019, uh, overall Chinese FDI globally outflow was $137 billion, out of which only $620 million came to Bangladesh, 0.46% of total Chinese FDI. 
around the world. Uh, Japanese FDI uh, outflow, net FDI outflow 2019, $258 billion. 0.03% uh, came to Bangladesh. Uh, Singapore, $50 billion uh, ar around the world. Only 0.5% came to Bangladesh. So even in FDI, India, $13 billion globally. Only 0.8% uh, came to Bangladesh. So even in FDI, you see the, the, you know, the prospect is sky high. And we are really at the very beginning or the very big introductory part of the curve. The growth stage is yet to uh, be sort of, uh, you know, uh, breached into or broken into. And the entire uh, sort of trade and investment potential for, from this Asian powerhouse and the Asia as an economic uh, energy side uh, remains untapped for Bangladesh. So what do we have to do, Mr. President, as you asked? Uh, well, I mean, I uh, we will hear more specifics from some of the business leaders we have here today. But let me uh, shed light on some of the uh, you know uh, very high level strategic levers that Bangladesh should look into. You know, there is a uh, strategy call when you when you look at you know taking advantage of a future direction, a future present and future sort of uh, economic uh, you know uh, uh, power. There is a strategy called future back strategy with, with, with the hyphen between the future and back. So you look at the future, you, are, you see what the direction is, where the growth potential is, and then you come back and you prepare yourself uh, accordingly. So I think Bangladesh for long has been doing really well with the present, uh, but it's about time with Bangladesh's rising economic strength, uh, rising economic fundamentals and the growth potential Bangladesh take a more futuristic look and deploy this future back strategy whereby we identify what is our investment potential from the Asia Pacific countries, what is our trade potential, particularly export to uh, economic, global economic powerhouses such as Japan, China, India, Singapore, ASEAN countries, and what we have to do. Secondly, uh, again, uh, looking at the future, are we future proofing our competitiveness? Bangladesh does have very strong competitiveness on certain areas, such as you know, uh, uh, competitive labor, for example. Uh, it has developed really good understanding of manufacturing of uh, low value product. But do those advantage hold in the future? Many of them will not. Uh, for one, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, the digital transformation, they're going to unsettled things, disrupt things uh, that we see in future. ASEAN countries, which are far ahead of Bangladesh in terms of skills base, they themselves will have to reskill 53 million of their workforce. So imagine how much of competitiveness uh, proofing that Bangladesh will have to do. And of course, we had a lot of the competitiveness areas such as trade competitiveness, the business environment competitiveness, although gradually increasing, but far from where they needed to. Uh, thirdly, a strategic approach. Again, for long, Bangladesh has been uh, sort of targeting investment or export destination without a proper strategy or looking at or de deploying the strategic lever. How do you use the trade and investment holy nexus? And you, if you look at the ASEAN countries, Vietnam, the latest, or even the European and North American countries, they use trade entry points as a, as a, as a sort of a catalyst for increasing FDI, increasing private investment domestic investment in their economy. Bangladesh has to use a lot more of that holy uh, nexus between trade and investment. And then finally, sustainability is becoming a very critical issue. Uh, investment or trade, I think increasingly countries, buyers, sectors are uh, putting a focus on whether we ensure enough of sustainability and the sustainability comes from three angles, ESG, environmental, social and governance, corporate governance, and so on. I know of a big investor in Bangladesh who's trying to come with a $2 billion investment in infrastructure, a nationally critical project. They have said they're ready to pump in the money as long as the environmental sustainability and safeguard measures are ensured by the government and the private sector. So I'll stop there, Mr. President. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Riaz. Thank you for setting the tone. Uh, <clears throat> I will bring in our next discussion. And before that, I'm just going to read out a headline from today's news. It says that RMG model replication in industries like footwear is the key to Bangladesh's export diversification. So we have with us today, uh, Sayed Nasim Manzoor, the Managing Director of Apex Footwear Limited. Sir, over to you. Thank you. 
Uh, Mr. President, thank you, DCCI and Ministry of Commerce for organizing the Bangladesh Trade and Investment uh, Summit 2021, and also for asking me to be a speaker today. Uh, our chief guest, Mr. Tafasal Hosan Mia, Secretary, Honorable Prime Minister's Office, our special guest, Ms. Fatima Yasmin, Secretary ERD, and our guest of honor, Ambassador Ito Naoki, and our fellow speakers. Um, at the inauguration, our Honorable Prime Minister said, uh, that Bangladesh is a bridge of opportunity. And the bridge that Bangladesh has to offer is not only with the rest of the world, but I believe specifically with Asia Pacific. As Dr. Masrus had pointed out, Asia has been a source of growth and economic output, not just recently and not just from the 1950s, but in fact, more than half of the world economic output for 18 of the 2021 20, centuries that we have has been from Asia. And this, I would call not just a restoration of Asia, but it's, a, it's not a revolution, but a restoration. Now, where is it coming from? It's coming from the numbers. Um, there was a late Swedish academic, uh, Mr. Rosling, and he had come up with an interesting pin code for the world. And the pin code for the world was that when there's 7 billion people, the pin code of the world would be 1114. And according to him, the one stood for 1 billion of Europe, 1 billion of America, and 1 billion of Africa, and 4 billion from Asia. If you add up the three ones and the four, that's 7 billion people. If you look at the projections by 2050, he actually theorized that the pin code of the world will change to what is called 1125, where the world's population will reach 9 billion. 1 billion will be from Europe, 1 billion will be from the Americas. The 1 billion of Africa will become 2, but the 4 billion of Asia will become 5. What this means, ladies and gentlemen, simply is that, even as the ADB has pointed out, by 2050, there will be 3 billion Asians which will have, who will have the same standard of living equivalent to those of Europe today. And Asia will amount for half of global output. Now, we all know the population pyramid, it's uh, slowing down, it's changing, and the population is getting heavier at the top, bottom is getting lighter. But if you look at consumption behavior, as was pointed out previously, this is a long-term market. Another long-term trend that profoundly affects Asia is climate change. And I would like to point out that if zero emissions are to be met by the middle of the century, then most of the costs would actually have to be borne by Asia, and also Asia will have to show leadership. And we are actually quite privileged because as we all know that most recently our prime minister has been awarded the SDG Progress Award at the recent UNGA and described as no less than as a, a jewel in the crown of the day. But what is truly impressive is that Bangladesh is doing it our way. We are finding a Bangladesh way of going forward. And I will talk about that a little bit later. Now, I would like to talk about seven specific opportunities that we see between Asia, Pacific, and Bangladesh. First, number one, why is this so important? If you look to our neighborhood, we have two of the biggest markets in the world and the two fastest, two of the strongest economies in the world, China and India. And if I give you specific numbers, as Dr. Masru started from China and India, China and India together now account for 31% of the entire footwear consumption in the world. As you know, I work in the footwear industry, and that is where the buying power. If you look at the top 10 markets for footwear today, for shoes, out of the top 10, six are from Asia. And these are countries that we would expect, China, India, of course, Japan, but countries that we don't expect, Pakistan, Indonesia, and ladies and gentlemen, Bangladesh at number nine. So there are opportunities and markets in our home and options trade. And this has been driven by what is called the MAC, the middle and the affluent class that is emerging in Bangladesh, who are spending rapid urbanization, lower dependency ratio. So the model that we are following in Bangladesh actually parallels more Indonesia and Vietnam rather than India, which was actually a benefit for our economy. Second, investment. We need to look to Asia for investment. Once again, Vietnam, the poster child for foreign direct investment. If you look at the numbers for 2020, out of the total number of FDI projects, not US dollar, but projects which actually equates to job more directly, 
the top three, the top six countries are actually Asian countries. The US comes in at number seven with 95 projects. China at 342, but the single largest country in number of projects, South Korea, 609. Japan, 272 projects. Singapore at 211 projects. So our focus and our obsession, if I may say, needs to change from looking for FDI from all over the world, but where we have FDI in our neighborhood. Third, look to Asia to invest out. Very recently, our prime minister has been speaking very forcefully about the need to diversify products, markets, but also to allow Bangladeshi businesses to invest out. Uh, the president of DCC, I mentioned this also in his keynote. And I think if you allow Bangladeshi companies to connect with Asian companies, to connect with global value chains for, for Asia. If you look at cement, agro-processing, we have Mr. Makhlub, who is a pioneer in the logistics and the automobile sector. We have major sources of growth here for our companies, but we need to be allowed to go out to invest. And this is another opportunity. Number four, infrastructure. We can learn, we can roll out, and we can link up. As was mentioned, whether it's BIMSTEC, whether it's Big B, whether it's ASEAN, the opportunity to link our economies to these corridors of growth is immense. And we happen to be at the right place at the right time. The Honorable PM, once again, in her inaugural at the DCCI summit said, she is uh, determined to make Saipur a regional airport. Once again, opportunity for Bangladeshi investments and foreign investments. Number five, finance. We all know about the FDI flows, but we also know, for example, Japan, who has been a tremendous multilateral partner, a direct bilateral partner, and a huge investor in Bangladesh for many years. And if we look to Japan for low-cost financing, there are funds available, but we need to be able to access them according to their conditions. Number six, services. Not many of us know that by 2034, the Indian e-commerce industry is actually going to be larger than the US e-commerce industry. It's currently at about 46.2 billion. And by 2025, sorry, it's currently at about, by 2025, it will be 114 billion. So from 46 to 114, that's your growth. So which markets are you chasing? The ones that are growing single digit or not growing? The ones that are going to double or triple or quadruple in the next 10 years. And what are the two fastest growing segments in the Indian e-commerce space? Groceries, which is means agro-processed foods, and fashion apparel. And we all know what Bangladesh can do in apparel. Number seven, track three, which is my favorite, people to people. We really have a huge opportunity here to connect the traditionally connected people of Asia. If you look at the kind of learnings and the experiences that can be shared between Asian economies, I believe this is a much more solid foundation for future growth for Bangladesh than maybe some ex external experiences from the Western world. I'm not being racist. I'm not being politically incorrect. I just think relevance is very important here. Let me give you a statistic, ladies and gentlemen. India has 7.8 scientists per thousand people. The US has 21. South Korea has 53.1 scientists per thousand people. Today, South Korea is a source not only of hard power, but soft power. And we know what South Korean brands are doing across the world. Who is to say if we allow ease of travel, ease of work, interconnectivity between the people of Asia. We cannot have an, an Arong in Mumbai, or we cannot have an Arong in Beijing. We have already seen Miniso in Dhaka. This is also soft power, and we need to do this. I'm impressed to see Bangladeshi chefs already working in the Maldives and software engineers working in Japan. We need to have more of this as we can use our human potential. But we need to do certain things to make this potential happen. I'm privileged to have here our honorable chief guest, the Prince, the uh, honorable secretary to the prime minister's office. And through his good offices, I would like to request five specific focus areas. First, implementation of policy on time. We have a lot of policy, sir, but these policies need to be time bound and delivered on time. And we need to hold people accountable. Time and time again, local and foreign investors tell us that they don't get decision. No is also a decision but we would like these to be delivered on time. Second, simplification of rules. If you look at the number of licenses, the number of documents that we need to still get in order to get a bond license or clear an import to consignment or move customs goods in and out of a bonded license facility, it's too much. We need to bring it down. Number three, 
we need an overhaul of the national board of revenue from a tax collector mentality to a financier of growth and as until that happens we are going to be hobbled in the growth that is possible and in fact in the targets that we have been set by our leadership most most importantly our honorable prime minister number four the example from singapore when Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew took over for the first time, he said that the two first impressions of a country are created by the airport and the airline. And look at what Changi Airport is today and look at what Singapore Airlines is today. Surely we can find partners to improve both Dhaka Airport and Bangladesh Biman. I'm very uh, grateful to our friends from Japan for the work that's going on in the new terminal. We look forward to it eagerly, but we have recently been reading about the, the horrific conditions in the Dhaka Airport of goods coming in and goods going out. And this is constraining growth. And last but not least, most important, I've saved my favorite for the last. Please trust business to do the right thing. We are as patriotic as everybody else. We are everything that we are today is because we are the privilege of being born in an independent and a rising and a powerful Bangladesh. I would like to say, let's stop talking about basket case. Let's talk about what Bangladesh can do. And here I'm going to end with a, with a very interesting quotation that I read the other day in the Atlantic. And this was actually uh, written by a, a well-known academic at the Asian Institute of Technology. Uh, and she, she wrote that, if I can quote, Asia, sorry, much of Bangladesh's growth has flown in the face of recommendations from international development institutions well-meaning NGOs and global environmental groups, October 9th, 2021. Bangladesh is already a climate success story. Bangladesh is finding our own ways to adapt to climate change, whether it is to improve forecasting, public infrastructure, training, or even campaigns. And the old model of we will grow now and green later or clean up later no longer works for Bangladesh. So I would like to say in conclusion that Asia has not only given us sheer population, or markets, Asia has given us an Asian model of capitalism, which is slightly different from the laissez-faire capitalism that Dr. Masuriyas has taught and learned, and also so have I. Asian role of capitalism has a significant role in strategic policy directions from government, not only for industrial development, but human development. And we are blessed to be in this country, and we look forward to engaging with our partners and friends from Asia Pacific in the century ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Nasim Manzur. Thank you very much for your points. And I'm sure the Honorable Chief Guest today has noted the uh, comments that you have made. And we will definitely create an outcome report for his uh, uh, knowledge and consideration. At this point of time, uh, I would like to welcome Barrister Nihat Kabir, the President of the Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce and Industry, MCCI. Madam President, could you please enlighten and update us on how the Bangladeshi business can expand, businesses can expand their business in the regional market and what are the issues and challenges being faced in the regional market? And of course, what the government can do in this regard. And of course, as a barrister of a profession, you do work with uh, overseas companies bringing in FDI into the country. So I would like to hear your view and experience. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Prasad. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all, honorable chief guest, uh, honorable special guests, uh, honor excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and privilege for me to be here today um, at this wonderful event organized by Dhaka Chamber of Commerce in celebration of the 50th year of Bangladesh's uh, independence and also significantly the 100th uh, anniversary birth anniversary of the father of the nation. Um, MCCI, as you all know, has represented Bangladesh's large industry and trade since 1904. And together with Dhaka Chamber, uh, we are, uh, I, I can safely say that we represent uh, the, the, the majority of the gamut of business in uh, Bangladesh. And uh, there really is not a lot to be said about the magnitude of the historical relationships between the countries uh, of the Asia Pacific region and Bangladesh and among ourselves. And uh, it's almost becoming an immutable truth that um, our connectivity uh, and our cooperation is essential for the growth, prosperity, and development, uh, not only of our individual countries, but of 
our entire region as a whole. Because in Asia, um, as uh, Nassim Manzur has pointed out, Dr. Mashuriaz has pointed out, the population is such that we need to continue this growth to meet the aspirations of our young and growing population. And uh, to me, doing business is not just about doing business. It is about meeting the aspirations and needs of the social uh, development needs of our people. And in Bangladesh, again, I'm proud to say, uh, we have a very large population. We are the most densely populated country perhaps in the world of any significant size. And um, as far as I'm concerned, this population is our biggest strength. Our people in Bangladesh, however, we need to provide uh, potential. Now, um, that's, well, it's always a pleasure to listen to so speaking of them, because there's a challenge. What I would like to press is that, look, Bangladesh is scheduled to graduate from LDC status. Uh, now in 2026, we have decided that. Um, our economic growth, we've all spoken about, we know about that. And our social uh, indicators have also been on an upward trend. Poverty, child, maternal mortality has been reduced significantly. Um, enrollment in primary education, and education is there, and the course has grown um, among more or better than most of our regional counterparts in achieving these uh, measures. Now, all this has been possible because mainly of two things. It, there's been a single-minded focus from the top policymakers in making this happen. And that's, that has been very visible over the last uh, decade, uh, decade, couple of decades or so. We have set goals and targets, and we have adhered to prudential macroeconomic policies which have allowed us to focus our activities on achieving these targets. And it is, I have no hesitation again in saying before this audience, um, before any audience, that we have had one of the most transformative leaders of this country over the last 10 years. And under her <clears throat> uh, government, under the, her strong and visionary leadership, we've had a stable government, which has definitely enabled our private sector with a very strong support and in the opening uh, program, the Honorable Prime Minister many times mentioned about the importance of the private sector in her strategy for the growth and development of Bangladesh. Now, what do we need to actually harness uh, to do, to harness these statements of intent and actually get the work done on the ground? Very recently, MCCI and Policy uh, uh, Exchange, we uh, have published the first ever country-specific uh, business climate index in Bangladesh. And there we have looked at uh, 10 pillars uh, on which business, the business climate is based. And we have seen that Bangladesh, while performing in the top half of these uh, pillars, still has a long way to go towards reaching uh, the stage where we can say that it is a fully competitive and uh, fully performing uh, business, that it has a fully performing business climate. As a lawyer, I receive and I deal with a lot of inquiries from foreign investors. One of the first things they said, I'm going into specifics and I will be stating some of the obvious here. Um, and I'm not going to go into the general uh, statements of how we have competitive advantages on that. That has been stated. That, that, that is a given to, in, in today's discussion. First thing, dispute resolution. Foreign investors, when they come in, the first question they ask is, how long does it take to resolve a dispute in Bangladesh? And I have to say that whereas in, say, Singapore, which we can only really aspire to now, 
a dispute will take 160 days to resolve. In Bangladesh, it will take closer to 1,500 days. But these are things which can actually be reduced again very quickly by a focused approach in procedural matters, not even in substantive matters. Uh, we are asked when they come in, what about your taxation regime? I will not even go into the tax rates. We have discussed that. In fact, last year, to my great surprise and great uh, uh, sort of appreciation, the Bangladesh government decided to reduce tax, corporate tax rates, even amidst this COVID uh, situation, where there is, of course, stresses on the economy. The issue is compliance. How many forms do I need to fill in to comply with my taxation requirements? How much time does it take? What amount of interaction do I need to have with tax officials which generate negative connotations? You will be perhaps surprised to note that the divisions outside of Dhaka and Chittagong were uh, voted to be much better for tax compliance purposes by our taxpaying businesses because the pressure is much lower, both on the taxpayer and on the tax collectors in those regions. So issues like this come up. When we ask, when we apply for, for a permit, permit or a certification to the government, and here I will say, to start a business in Bangladesh, you need a minimum of three uh, permits, approvals, certifications, licenses, which is the uh, TIN, the taxpayer identification number, the VAT registration, and the trade license but you may need upwards of 100 other approvals to run a business. Again, time is of essence here. One of the most negative replies we get uh, or reactions we get from our foreign investors and actually from our domestic investors is that when we make an application, we do not get a response for months and months and months. This is the issue. And if we can time it, it becomes much easier. And in today's day, with the IT infrastructure that is in place, it can be done quite easily. We are there. We are there at the last mile. We just need to execute to get up to uh, significantly easier business climate. Now, I'm uh, going to go into a couple of other, uh, other issues here, that if regional cooperation and integration are to be advanced, that if Bangladesh is actually to engage fully and reap the benefits of this, we need to look at our infrastructure for trading, our infrastructure and our policies for market access. Um, uh, my previous speakers have spoken about the FDI. We need to look at how we can reduce for ourselves and how we can negotiate the reduction for our businesses of uh, tariffs and NTBs, non-tariff barriers overseas. We need to talk seriously and take action, not just talk, take action on uh, trade facilitation, improvement of trade facilitation with simplification and transparency of the regulations and procedures. We need improvement and expansion of our transportation and telecommunication infrastructure. Um, in energy generation, Bangladesh has done very well. We need to work on transmission and distribution. Um, and we also need to look at the supporting service industries. The government of Bangladesh very rightly has targeted the setting up of 100 special economic zones so that there is service land available for industry. But those service sectors need to be developed in a targeted and focused manner. If we are to move forward, we need to assert our new found self-confidence, which we have generated through our excellent economic performance over the last uh, uh, several decades. We need to lose our reticence, our shyness, and our fear of engaging with our regional counterparts on equal terms. We shy away from signing FTAs because of the perceived immediate short-term uh, 
impact and perhaps revenue loss. We need to look forward and say that if we do this today, in the next 10 years, our economy will grow at 10% or at 12%, not at 8%. We will make this up. So that needs to happen. Um, one thing I want to very much emphasize and which uh, the Siemens will mention was that connectivity is not about just hard infrastructure. Business is not done just on terms of business. Person-to-person -person connection is extremely important. And there are two areas in which we can work. One is education. Our children are going away to Canada, to the US, to Australia. We need to make the Asia Pacific region more attractive and accessible to them for quality education. Uh, His Excellency, the Master of Japan is here. We need to set up, we are looking at Japan to be one of our biggest uh, economic partners going forward. We need to set up not just tens, but hundreds of schools across the country where the language will be taught so that we can communicate well and we can interact well. This is just as, as an example. Another is COVID has given us the opportunity to deal in the uh, cooperate in the healthcare sector. We are already accessing uh, assistance from the region. We can also uh, extend our own research capacities, our capabilities, our expertise in delivering, for example, vaccination in large numbers. Bangladesh has a, has a system which is second to none in the world. We can extend these uh, assistances. We are not necessarily always going to be at the receiving end. We have the capacity to give a lot today, but we need the confidence to be able to go forward. We need to be able to go and break the perception deficit, which still uh, hampers Bangladesh's entry into uh, global econo economies. We are no longer the Bangladesh of the 70s and 80s. We are the Bangladesh of 2021. And we are a leading player in the global market. We need to be able to assert that very strongly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm sure the Honorable Ambassador of Japan will address in his remarks the points you've clarified. And of course, uh, the Chief Guest has and the Special Guest has been through at all times. At this point of time, I would bring in Another pioneer in the industry who needs no introduction. We have with us Mr. Abdul Matib Ahmed. He's the president of the India Bangladesh Chamber of Commerce and Industry and a former president of the Apex Trade Body, the Federation of Bangladesh Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Sir, over to you for your comments. You have heard all the discussions. Yeah, thank you very much, Rizal Sam, uh, Honorable President of the CCI. Um, <clears throat> sitting in, uh, in my home on Friday morning and listening to my good friends all around, it gives me new energy that yes, Bangladesh has at last come out of this COVID crisis. And yes, there's a huge future for us to move around and expand our businesses, expand our relationship with the world. I must thank the CCI and the Commerce Ministry because today Dhaka Chamber is doing a global job. Today, sitting in Dhaka, we are talking to people all around the world. And this thinking globally is what interests me in today's meeting. Asia Pacific is a zone that we can really look into. My group has been with India, business with Tata, Hero, etc. We have been doing actually all businesses within India, within Bangladesh and within the global of this Asia Pacific only. And I found that, yes, there is a lot of business. Today, if we look at Bangladesh, this ACZs and the power situation, we have enough power now, we have gas, all the elements of industrialization has been put in place. Now, what do we need? We need partners. We need to have a global value chain where Bangladesh can partner with people and industries all around us. We have Japan, we have Vietnam, China, India, so many other nations from where we can um, get the expertise and 
joined hands in production, not only in the product out in Bangladesh, but also exporting our components to the other countries. I'll try to explain to you on the automobile trade where I am working in whole life now, although I have other industries. But in automobile, I see huge uh, possibilities. Our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina had declared 2020 as a light engineering year. And she had uh, asked her to look into, to ask us to look into the possibilities of producing our own cars, producing our own trucks, buses, motorcycles, and whatnot, and exporting them to all over the world. This is where I think the global value chain has got a huge possibility. We have today the four-wheeler policy announced where the electrical vehicle or EV vehicles are now approved by the government, which means we will be able to not only lead in the EV vehicle segment in the world, but also lead in the charging system, battery system, and so many other areas that the whole world is moving into from the normal engine to the electrical side. The two-wheeler policy is already there. One, the four-wheeler policy was on, we found already $200 million investment. And I have seen the project coming up in Minas uh, It's coming up very fast. So that gives an opportunity to Japan, Vietnam, China to really look into Bangladesh and also India to invest together, where not only we buy only from those countries, but we also export to them the components that we can manufacture here much cheaper than even in the origin countries. Today, Bangladeshi motorcycles are being exported. Today, uh, Walton's uh, refrigerators are exported all over the world. Our uh, telephone and uh, computers are also being exported from Bangladesh, which we never imagined a, a few years back. So there is, Bangladesh is a miracle country. We have a government which supports the business from A to Z. Even during the COVID-19 situation last year, Honorable Prime Minister gave us funds to carry over our burdens and try to be there so that when COVID ends, we are there to come back. Inshallah, we are there. We can see the comeback is coming very fast. And it's DCCI, the Commerce Ministry, which are helping us to not only work for Bangladesh, but also work for the world. Today, our Honorable Prime Minister is not only leading Bangladesh on the environment thing, she's leading the world. And she has got so many prizes on that. So what I would like to tell you that uh, today is a day where Bangladesh must showcase its abilities and we must open our capital account. We should be able to also invest in each other countries especially India, China, Japan, Vietnam, and they should also join with us. Governments, the, the non-woven, uh, non big textiles can now be set up jointly. So in short, what I would like to tell that today Bangladesh has emerged as the real area or real place for good investment, high income, and also high growth. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your kind remarks. Um, at this point of time, uh, uh, just for the information of all our guests, we have 80 participants here, and especially we have our friend from the UNS CAP, uh, Mr. Raj Rajan Suresh Ratna. Um, this goes to show the economic resilience and the, uh, the concentration and the uh, cooperation between the public and private as a sector. In Bangladesh, because you know, on a Friday, on a weekend, we have the uh, secretary of the prime minister's office, the ERD secretary, and our guest of honor, as well as the private sector, on a weekend, uh, discussing the uh, the dialogue and the way forward and how the public and private can work together. So, uh, I would like to bring in the deputy head and the senior economic affairs of the UNS Cup. Uh, Dr. Rajan Suresh Ratna. Uh, South Asia is the largest market in the world in terms of population, of course, but we have not been able to take advantage of our market by strengthening intertrade between South Asian countries. And we're looking forward to your valuable remarks on 
the challenges that stay within the Asia and Pacific region and how these can be addressed for a strong fraternity within Asia and the Pacific economies for the uh, regional business revival. Dr. Rahman. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Let me join uh, some uh, other uh, panelists in, in complimenting the DCCI and the Ministry of Commerce for hosting this event, which is very, very timely. And uh, I must also compliment for the keen interest shown by uh, the Chief Guest uh, Secretary from PMO, uh, Special Guest Secretary Yadi, and the Honorable uh, Ambassador um, of Japan to, uh, to Bangladesh. Uh, uh, I, I must uh, compliment all of you for this excellent uh, uh, you know, event and the theme. Uh, <clears throat> I have a few uh, things to say, and I will focus only on, given the possibility of the time, uh, on two things. Uh, one, the the context of uh, uh, graduation of uh, uh, Bangladesh in coming years, and that uh, really would have some impact on, uh, you know, harnessing the economic potential. And the second, the impact of uh, uh, COVID uh, globally, regionally and to Bangladesh. Uh, and these two have brought the challenges, but has also brought the, uh, uh, you know, uh, opportunities, uh, making uh, the industry, making the government officials and the policymakers to be more confident that under these adverse circumstances, if things can be improved, if achieving uh, SDG, the progress towards it, can be accelerated, then definitely, yes, there is a ray of hope. Uh, in this regard, uh, much have been talked, but I would like to point on a on, on few or things. One is uh, we have been talking about, and we have done several studies, even for South Asia and Bangladesh, especially in graduation and in textiles. Uh, pure economic theory says, uh, you know, over dependence on a particular sector or a product. Uh, is not good for an economy. And over-dependence to a select group of countries also as an export destination is not too good. And both of these, Bangladesh is likely to face uh, the pinch uh, upon graduation because the largest uh, uh, sector in which it has uh, uh, global advantage on exporting is textiles. Uh, and the the country or a block to which it is exporting uh, mostly is European Union. And upon graduation, both of these may um, uh, be impacted. And and that is why this question, which Mr. Azwan you ask, is very very important. Uh, a product diversification and market diversification is very very important. All the speakers have talked about, and even you have highlighted the importance of South Asia. When we talk about a population. And especially if you talk in terms of, uh, you know, textile, pharmaceutical, IT, services, the population is a market, irrespective of that at what stage of buyer's value chain that population is. And definitely the problem we all know and recognize, South Asia is the least integrated region in the world. Uh, and uh, uh, has it been designed? Has it been by default? Uh, there are many studies which have come. The fact is that uh, despite, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bangladesh, and I will give you the case of Bangladesh, exporting to European Union, which is far, far away, the cost of trade or the trade cost in ad valorem terms to European Union is cheaper than exporting to South Asia. Now, if with the neighboring countries with whom you have boundaries, still your trade cost is so high that it is not able to, to match up to uh, a, a global destination where you are, then there is something wrong. And something wrong which needs to be resolved locally and regionally. Uh, one is infrastructure. And we know how uh, South Asian countries uh, have, uh, or where do they stand in terms of infrastructure, whether it is a soft infrastructure or a hard infrastructure. And in this regard, I think for South Asia integration, cross-border connectivity is very, very important. 
trade cannot happen without transport connectivity, without ICT connectivity, without energy connectivity. And these three are very, very important. When we talk about a paperless trade regime, and I will come to it later, I mean, you require an ICT uh, communication channel, you require a platform uh, where these countries are talking at the same level of uh, data exchange. Otherwise, uh, 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 the data will go in the junk and the receiving country will not know what it is coming from. The uh, third encouraging thing is looking at Bangladesh and seeing how good its pharma sector and IT sector is doing. And that has also been highlighted. Uh, and definitely uh, certain policy interventions in pharma pharma is required considering that Bangladesh's graduation is at the door and many of the trips facility, uh, flexibilities uh, would either be nullified or minimized. Uh, and that is a, a reality. Of course, I know the discussions and debate is going on in the WTO uh, on, uh, upon the graduation. Of course, LDC flexibility in trips has been given, but there is no clarity in what will happen to the graduating LDCs. The third issue is uh, we have very recently done uh, a value chain analysis on textile, looking at fiber up to garment. And it has given us a very good uh, encouraging result. We will be publishing by the end of this year or next year. But I can tell you that we had uh, a, a expert group meeting in August and uh, we had private sector from Bangladesh, had a policymaker from Bangladesh and it came. But it came out that every stage of textile there is already complementarities and existing value chain. Of course, the potential is uh, totally unutilized, but it exists. Either you look at a unit value price, at what unit value price you are sourcing a raw material from within the SARC or outside, at what price you are exporting, I mean, the, the FOV price at, at the gate of the Bangladesh, is much cheaper than what the other countries in SARC are importing. Of course, the quality, the brand, there are so many other issues which get involved into it. But these are the immense potentialities which need to be explored. And we have identified at six digit level as to where and how which country can become a part of a regional supply chain in this particular case. And that would be very, very important in terms of LDC graduation. Because uh, uh, you know, uh, Bangladesh, uh, uh, biggest market, EU will continue, will get during the transition period of time. But the duty preferences which Bangladesh was enjoying because of the DFQF, unless that get factored into the price of exporter, you will not be able to retain the market share in EU because then you will become a higher priced. And I do not know how the, the, the policy makers, how uh, the industry is going to adjust that shock of a reduction in the duty preference into the business model so as to still export at that price without any export incentive because the other implication on Bangladesh will be once you graduate you also lose the flexibility of giving subsidies to your export if you become um, uh, in the WTO you, you, you have a, a different discipline on it so uh, these are these issues and also there are uh, also highlighted and which I would like to touch upon the last is uh, the uh, we talked about a non tariff barriers and there are two issues we did several studies many a times when we find we find there is always an issue relating to oh the non tariff barrier which is imposed on us by the exporting country. But many a times and in one two cases we found it an industry uh, stated. It's not only the, the problem and the challenge on the other side, it's also a challenge inside. If I want a certificate of compliance, the cost of getting that certificate is very high. The procedural burden is very high. There are not many agencies who can uh, give this. There are no mutual recognition agreement. There is no conformity assessment. So how even if I wanted to get this certification at home, and that is where uh, Bangladesh need to work out now in developing these regulations, regulators, and then the government can become the facilitator for getting them mutual recognition for issuance of these kind of certification. And this would be important not only for the goods. When we are talking about a lot have been talked about services and good, it has, good that it has been pointed out. If you look at the Bangladesh overall economy, the contribution of services to the GDP is much higher than many other uh, sectors. 
and and even mutual recognition agreement on the education system on the doctors on the nurses uh, is very very important to tap that market otherwise uh, we will continue uh, talk, talking about and end of the day it will it will remain like that and the last which i would like to point out in terms of ldc graduation is and it, it, it was talked about you know preferential rules of origin losing the preferential in uh, fta we did prescribe we, we published last year uh, ldc graduation because four three out of four ldcs in south asia are graduating so we devised certain uh, policy uh, recommendations and one of the recommendations was that given and considering that uh, eu being the largest market continuance of dfqf will not be there so either bangladesh will have to go for some kind of a reciprocal or non reciprocal fta with europe if it wants the market access it needs to look into south asia and there is a ray of hope but i i, I don't know whether it has initiated or this process has started or not because we have been talking with bangladesh we have been talking with bhutan and we have been talking with nepal in saying in safta there is a provision there is a specific article which gave maldives the flexibility that even when maldives graduate it will continue to get these concessions and benefits of ldc there is a provision there is a legal provision at it and we have been prescribing to all these three ldcs please join collectively your hands in going to the sarc secretariat tabling a proposal that that extension of article should be extended to bangladesh bhutan and nepal then at least you would have secured the same privileges which you got before graduating or when the safta was signed and that is strategic would strategically would be good because you are talking about apta apta also when you graduate you will be competing with india china korea on similar terms you cannot afford to and if there is a precedence in safta you can put it in there because bangladesh sri lanka and india are a common member so if you get consensus in safta you will also have your allies in apta and so you can then build it on in other ftas or other preferential trading agreements where bangladesh is going to be a party and you can say and most of these negotiations are not very perfect it, it it tries to accommodate and adjust everybody's situation and i think this is a right time is for waiting for january 2027 this is the time when you need to start working on it thank you very much thank you thank you mr rathna i mean thank you for your insights uh, we have come to the end of the discussion from the esteemed panelist um very very thankful to the guest of honor the special guest and the chief guest today for spending the almost uh, one hour and 20 minutes listening to all the discussions at this point of time i'm going to invite our guest of honor ambassador ethan alki your country has been a development partner of bangladesh and we are going to celebrate 50 years of diplomatic relations with japan we have come a long way but we still have a long way to go and japan's investors are looking into ai hazard they are looking into further investments in bangladesh and be a part of the growth of bangladesh together in hand in hand so i would request you to provide uh, your valued address and of course address any of the discussion that you have heard today if you wish to excellent chief uh, tanaki thank you uh, rizwan uh, thank you very much for uh, having me here so uh, the chief guest uh, mr muhammad fazal hossein mia secretary prime minister's office uh special guest uh, ms fatima yasmin secretary ERD ministry of finance distinguished uh, speakers and participants assalamu alaikum good morning and shubo shukal uh, it's so nice to uh, be uh, here with you uh, sharing uh, this platform with so many familiar uh, faces uh yes bangladesh is growing dhaka is no doubt the most vibrant and dynamic capital of the world and in the world and bangladesh is now globally positioned as the development role model uh i just want to quote one uh statistics per capita income according to standard charter imf uh in five years time your per capita income reach $3000 i think that is a very very symbolic uh, development 
So with three thousand dollar per capita income, Bangladesh is uh, taking off as it graduates uh, from LDC. So this uh, middle class, affluent class will really spur the domestic consumption. I think uh, uh, in five years time, you are going to enter into a different uh, stage of economy. Uh, similarly, in five years time, you are going to see a very different uh, phases of uh, infrastructure. Uh, now Japan is working on uh, Dhaka Metro, uh, airport extension, Matabari deep sea port, and also you are doing some other infrastructure, but in five years time, so these infrastructure will be ready. So uh, the infrastructure used to be a bottleneck for investment, but the story will change. So I think we are really in a sort of uh, uh, good uh, cycle, upward cycle of economic growth, uh, infrastructure development and so forth. So uh, I think political stability behind that has been a very, very important uh, factor. Uh, not to mention this geographic, geographical, strategic, uh, or strategically located position of the uh, Bangladesh. Uh, I think uh, the Mr. Reyes mentioned uh, Japan has been the largest uh, uh, export market in Asia uh, for Bangladesh uh, because Bangladesh has been showing resilience under uh, the pandemic situation. If you look at the uh, export to Japan between July and September uh, this year, uh, that increased by 10% compared to last year. So hopefully, we are going to have a record high number of export coming from Bangladesh to Japan uh, during this uh, current uh, fiscal year. So, but I think we have a really good sign and post corona economic recovery could provide real opportunities for Bangladesh to attract further uh, FDIs. The country will be a new frontier of investment in the region and Bangladesh could be the first choice of China plus one investment uh, destination. But there are some uh, challenges. Uh, I agree with uh, what uh, Syed Nashim uh, Manizu said. So there are four or five issues uh, government needs to uh, address. Uh, government has been attacking this aspect of investment climate. Even during the corona pandemic, I think uh, uh, this government worked really hard and came up with uh, some of the structural reform, uh, regulatory reform, which we really appreciate. And leadership of Honorable Prime Minister was really uh, commendable. Uh, still, there are some uh, remaining uh, challenges uh, for those existing companies. I have been saying that uh, you should address those issues and challenges uh, faced by existing companies. So unless you resolve those challenges by existing companies, you don't see uh, much of the further prospective investors uh, coming to the country and investing in this country. So those issues should increase, include customs clearance, foreign remittance by branch offices, import transaction by telegraphic transfer and RMG cash incentives to new markets, including Japan. Telegraphic transfer, I honestly hope the government will lift restrictions as this issue of telegraphic transfer is widely, and uh, this method of telegraphic transfer is widely and commonly used in Asia in settling import uh, transactions. This is very, very important. Also, RMG cash incentives in new market, 4% cash incentives, but this is only applicable to type B and type C companies. So foreign companies should equally be eligible for the cash incentives. I'm talking about this because this is very important to reduce the cost of doing business here in Bangladesh, but also this is related to perception image on Bangladesh by foreign investors. So as you do structural reform, as you do regulatory reform, 
you can enhance the image of Bangladesh. You can change the perception of uh, Bangladesh among the minds, in the minds of uh, prospective investors. I think that's equally uh, important. As for customs clearance among neighboring countries, Vietnam and Myanmar recently commenced the automated cargo clearance system with cooperation from Japan. So I hope and expect we can reach that stage in the near future. So competition is here uh, with those neighboring countries uh, inside the subcontinent, also in those countries in ASEAN. So digitalization and automation, be it in customs, taxation, or licensing, will be a critical component of structural uh, reform. Next year, yes, uh, as uh, Rezvan said, we are going to celebrate the 50 years of our diplomatic relations. But during the year of celebration between us, we accept, expect further positive developments on the economic front. Uh, first, of course, Dhaka Metro Line number six will start its operation. And then uh, Mitsubishi Motor Company will complete feasibility study towards CKD investment. As Mr. Ahmad suggested, so development of automotive industry is a very, very important. It will have an immense impact on the manufacturing industry in Japan. So I have a high hope on this Mitsubishi's investment in automotive sector. Then this is going to be the first CKD plant here in Bangladesh. So first national brand car of internal combustion engine will be manufactured here in Bangladesh. I think that is going to be very, very significant. Then also, as Rizwan mentioned, the Japanese economic zone in Arai Hazal, located just outside Dhaka, will be open to investors. I want to emphasize that it is crucial to bring Arai Hazal economic zone a success to boost the economy, to encourage further FDIs. I advocate that Arai Hazal should provide best possible facilities, infrastructure, uh, and tax incentives in Asia. So Arai Hazar should be good enough uh, to uh, compete with other economic zones outside Bangladesh or those uh, in the ASEAN countries. Eventually, this economic zone is expected to accommodate 100 companies with a value of 1 billion US dollars investment in total. Arai Hazar can be an international economic zone as we have already received interest from our neighboring uh, countries, those companies in neighboring countries. So I think Arai Hazel is a real litmus test uh, whether Bangladesh will continue to attract foreign investment, international investment or not. So I do really hope that uh, coordinated and uh, focused effort uh, will be made to provide the best possible environment in Arai Hazel. So uh, Matabari is of course a game changer and uh, uh, thanks to uh, the ERD secretary, our year long project has been moving really smoothly, really well. And Japan uh, increased uh, yen loan to Bangladesh 10 times higher in 10 years from 39 billion yen to three, 373 billion yen, which is roughly 3.3 billion US dollars. So we are so proud that Japan is part of uh, this uh, Bangladesh's uh, quality infrastructure uh, building. Uh, next year will provide us opportunities to deepen our friendship further and arrive at the win-win uh, partnership. So it is my honor and pleasure to say that Japan will continue collaborating closely with Bangladesh in its development journey. But uh, before concluding, I want to say a little bit about uh, free trade agreement uh, because uh, Ms. Nihad Kobil uh, talked about a very, very important message. Don't shy away from FTAs. Don't shy, shy away uh, from negotiating rather ambitious uh, FTAs, EPAs. I think that's a very important, great uh, message. I think you should really try to uh, work with FTAs with those neighboring countries, major 
uh, trading partners in ASEAN as well as in East Asia. Uh, in that sense, I do really welcome a rather strong appetite coming from the government to join uh, RCEP. So it's a very, very important regional uh, trading framework. Uh, but I think beauty of having uh, EPAs with those countries mean that you can not only negotiate the level of tariffs, but also you can come up with rules in on trade, trade and trading services, as well as investment, uh, trade facilitation. Even you can talk about uh, conformity of regulations. So I think uh, uh, having FTAs and EPAs will further uh, give them the resilience uh, to your economy. I think that's a very, very important part of having FTAs. Uh, for uh, education, uh, as uh, Nihat mentioned, yes, we are looking forward to having more cooperation uh, in the area of uh, education. Uh, if an uh, increasing number of uh, the schools can teach uh, Japanese here in Bangladesh, uh, that would be very nice. Nowadays, increasing number of Japanese uh, universities are providing education in English. I think there'll be more opportunities for Bangladeshi students and come and study in Japan. As of now, we have about 3,000 Bangladeshi students studying in Japanese universities, but we only hope that the number will uh, increase. And similarly, uh, you know, we have uh, started to uh, give uh, residential status work permit for those specified uh, skilled workers. So we have not got uh, yet any uh, Bangladesh specified skilled worker under this new system, but with the cooperation uh, the, between the governments, uh, hopefully uh, we can do skills training, we can do language training, so that we can have Bangladesh people uh, to work in Japan in those sectors uh, such as uh, caregiving, nursing, construction, hotel, uh, agriculture, those areas. So uh, thank you very much for having me. And I'm really hoping that uh, we can move on further to make our shared dream a reality. Thank you very much uh, for having me on Ektonabad. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Um, we have our colleagues from uh, our co-host, the Ministry of Commerce, in the session as well. They have been uh, taking notes of all the recommendations, as well as the my colleagues in DCCI. Uh, they also mentioned that they also take the notes of the UNESCAP re recommendation as well. And uh, of course, uh, the, Mr. Syed Nassim Manzur also commented that you identified correctly the uh, in, uh, providing faster customs clearance for not just RMG, but all sectors across the board. In our discussion yesterday, we also discussed that the RMG success model should be applied to all other sectors because the prime minister has been very vocal on export diversification. In order to do that, the way we have made RMG a success story, we want all other sectors to come forward like leather, footwear, pharmaceuticals, and so on, many others. Um, for the last 95 minutes, we have seen that our special guest has been taking serious notes. And I think she has a lot to share from all the uh, panel discussion that she's had today. At this point of time, I would humbly request the Honorable Secretary of the Economic Relations Division, Ms. Fatma Yasmin, to deliver her address. Madam Secretary. Thank you very much, Riaz Pai. Uh, uh, Mr. Rizwan Rahman, President DCCI, the Chair of the Session. Uh, Mr. Mahmoud Tawazal Hosamiya, Secretary PMO, Honorable Chief Guest of the Session. Uh, Guest of Honor, Mr. Ito Naiki, Excellencies, distinguished uh, guests, discussants, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and very good morning. This is indeed my pleasure to be with you in this important event. To begin, let, my, uh, let me express my sincere thanks to the organizers for inviting me in this enlightening session, Asia and Pacific and Bangladesh Harnessing Economic Potentials, jointly organized by the Ministry of Commerce and DCCI. Uh, thank you very much, uh, DCCI pre uh, President, for your uh, presentation, and thank you very much for all the uh, uh, dis distinguished discussions for your valuable uh, comments and the recommendations. 
ladies and uh, gentlemen, we have been heard that Bangladesh is a uh, rapidly growing economy under the uh, very visionary leadership of our uh, Honorable Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina. We are able to maintain the economic growth in last one decade, and uh, uh, you have mentioned, and I also uh, uh, mentioned it uh, with great pleasure that Bangladesh main maintained 6.9% growth over the decade. This, this number is very important for us that we are growing and we are going in the right direction. Bangladesh become a fastest growing economy of the Asia Pacific region. Our GDP size is 355 billion. It was not even 100 billion uh, 20 years back. And our per capita income uh, rose to 2,227. Along with the high economic growth, we have been able to make substantial progress in every socioeconomic indicators over the year. That is the other achievement of the uh, country. I am not going to mention all the figures and data. Uh, these are uh, well recognized and well known to all. The COVID pandemic has interrupted our development momentum a bit. Uh, we have been hit tremendously as in many of the nations. However, despite the crisis, despite the challenges, growth rate has remained in the positive trajectory for the last consecutive years. We thank again the visionary leadership and the prudent macroeconomic management of the country. How we have this economic growth. Bangladesh experience in recent years, the development and that growth that has been coming from the numerous factors like conducive policy support, improving essential infrastructure, wider inclusion of women in the workforce, resilient, dynamic, and engaging private sector. We have heard some of the statistics given by the national and international uh, organizations. Let me sum up what was uh, what, uh, what were those statistics and what did they say? Um, for example, the IMF recently focused Bangladesh GDP growth over 6% in 2022. Asian Development Bank said it will be 6.8%. According to the report of the Center for Economic and Business Research, Bangladesh ranks 40th among 193 nations. Uh, this year, and the country will reach uh, 25th position in 2034. According to the World Economic League, Bangladesh economy would grow at one of the fastest rates in 2020 and uh, within, within 2020 and 2034. Standard Chartered uh, Economic Focus said that GDP will grow over 7% in this fiscal year. And Bangladesh will be a US dollar 500 billion economy by the fiscal year 2026. These are the few examples of forecasting about Bangladesh. Basically, what I wanted to say here that all this focus says Bangladesh is going forward in the right direction. It also says that we need to work very hard in a coordinated and concerted matter to make this happen. Bangladesh in its development journey has adapted a holistic approach through development in all areas. Madam Secretary, you're muted. Uh, sorry. Yes. I don't know how it happened. 
Oh, sorry, sorry. So, so it's our development uh, strategy is inclusive and uh, uh, we uh, adapted a very holistic approach. For example, in infrastructure development, we have taken mega projects like uh, um, um, for the beach, Metro Rail, Bangabandhu Tunnel, Rupur Nuclear Power Plant, etc. And this mega project cost around 40 billion US dollar for the economy of 355 billion dollar. This mega project is uh, government is investing huge amount of money in the mega project, despite their size. Why government is investing in this mega project? Because government thinks that these projects are important for increasing trade and investment. Um, Bangladesh is also implementing uh, its vision to transfer the country in digital, uh, um, into a digital Bangladesh. Extraordinary achievement has been achieved. We have also heard that in power generation in construction of rail, road, port, airport, all these will facilitate trade and investment. And at the same time, government is heavily investing in health, education, skill development. We are also, uh, uh, you know, investing so that uh, 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 the, uh, we have the manpower which can match the need for um, IR 4.0. I hope this all will contribute uh, to our development aspirations. Distinguished case, the private sector has been playing the most important a pivotal role in the in our development process through their participation in the trade and investment. Bangladesh success in trade, particularly in export is well known, well recognized. In spite of various challenges, limitations, Bangladesh has been able to utilize every opportunity created in the regional and multilateral tiering system. As a result, our export has been increasing almost every year. Increased export is not only earning much needed foreign currency for us, but also creating a huge employment through their backward and uh, forward linkages. The government, uh, the policy, uh, the government's policy reform is always there to facilitate trade and investment and this is very much in the priority agenda to make necessary reform, necessary incentive, necessary um, support given to the uh, uh, this very important sector. For attracting FD, FDI, Bangladesh offers the most liberal investment regime in South Asia in terms of legal protection of foreign investment, generous fiscal incentives, concessional on machinery imports, and unrestricted exit policy, full repatriation of dividends and capital on exit. We always, uh, Mr. Uh, Itosan is here, we always uh, in discussion on how best we can utilize the economic zone at our RI hazard, which is which is developed for uh, you know uh, the Japanese investors. The government has taken steps to establish hundred economic zones by two thirty. That is estimated to create direct and in indirect employment of uh, more than ten million people and increase export by additional forty million. I have with uh, me our colleague Secretary PMO. He is uh, working that how best we can we can attract uh, foreign direct investment the, our uh, local investors uh, 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 to improve our trade and 
investment regime. Um, effective and efficient entrepreneurship drive along with supporting low role of the government policies have been resulted in our uh, success in our export sector, uh, in our um, remittance earning sector, in our domestic uh, domestic resource mobilization sector, attracting uh, local business and SMEs. In addition, Bangladesh has been very successful in utilizing the LDC specific trade related international support measures, which is ISMS in short. The most important ISM that Bangladesh has been utilizing are the duty-free quota free market access along with the preferential rules of origin. Flexibilities under the TRIPS, which is trade related aspects of intellectual property rights, agreement of WTO and the cash incentives in export given by the government. According to the WTO report, the rate of utilization of DF uh, QF facility is highest for Bangladesh among the LDCs. As a result, 70% of our total exports is carried out under duty-free quota-free facilities. It's a huge benefit in terms of competitiveness. Similarly, we could make best use of TRIPS facilities, particularly in case of pharmaceutical products. Our local industry are now capable of uh, meeting the 98% of pharmaceutical demand. We are also exporting medicines in a number of the countries. Uh, all these are contributing in ensuring, uh, ensuring trade and uh, local demand. However, we are aware that Bangladesh has been recommended to uh, graduate from LDC from LDC status. We will be getting out of LDC list by 2026, and all these facilities we are enjoying will be seized up. And for that matter, we are preparing ourselves that how we can be competitive in absence of these facilities offered to Graduation from the LDC status is no doubt a great pride for the whole nation. This is also a recognition of our prudent policies and efforts for making best use of our limited resources. However, we are fully aware about the challenges posed by this LTC graduation. And I am very happy to inform you that uh, we are, as Nihatapa said, the alternative, alternative measure of this duty-free quota-free uh, uh, facility is forging PTA or FTA. We already have a PTA with one of the uh, one of our neighboring countries, and we are in a discussion with 10 countries to have either PT or FTA. And uh, we are very hopeful that we will be having two more very soon. I want uh, to assure that we are already started our works in order to ensure smooth and sustainable graduation by overcoming the positive impacts which may create uh, by uh, um, getting out of the list of LDCs. A national committee headed by the principal secretary to the honorable prime minister has been formed where all the key ministries and trade bodies have been included. Uh, uh, FBCCI, DCCI, MCCI, all, all the apex body are included at that committee so that we have planned, we can have the strategy that benefit all. Under this national committee, seven areas, seven specific areas will be covered by seven committee headed by seven secretaries. We also have a joint task team 
there we have the government, we have the development and trading partners, and we have rep uh, we have rep representatives from the private sector. So uh, I I think that this participation, this broad bit based participation of the government, private sector, development and trading and uh, partners will help us uh, uh, to give the direction to the national committee that what we should do, what we need to uh, change, what are the issues uh, uh, need to be changed. While we will expo explore all the strategic options in formulating the STS, that is the smooth and sustainable transition strategy. Our main focus will be enhancing our overall competitiveness of the economy by enhancing productivity, improving ease of doing business situation, developing infrastructure, human and institutional capacity building and improvement in other relevant areas. We will also further strengthen our efforts to enhance the resource mobilization. That is the key for uh, key for the government for making further investment. We have taken note of the discussions today and uh, the discussion and recommendations. Uh, those will be very very useful for us when we will uh, formulating our policy interventions and supports needed uh, to improve the delivery of our, our trade and investment. We need cooperation and uh, we need uh, cooperation from all the sectors. Madam, Madam Secretary, you're muted again. I don't know how that's happening because you were talking. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, this is fine now. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, our our development partners, our trading partners, the academia, the researcher, the private sector, the CSO, everyone we are working together in, uh, in this endeavor uh, to achieve. The development, uh, the development goal we are uh, given and we are aspired to achieve. Taking this opportunity, I am pleased to mention that Bangladesh is no longer a, a dependent country. I have my colleague uh, Itosan here. He knows that we are not dependent on aid. Rather, we take loan and we repay it back. So that is also a, a very important factor and a matter of great pride. We now rely more on trade and investment that will provide benefit for all the um, um, all all the people of the country. I am confident that with cooperation, with support, with guidance from all the sector, we will be. Uh, able to further accelerate our development journey to achieve the vision we are given by the father of the nation with the vision given by the, our honorable prime minister. So with that, uh, I conclude here, thanking again the organizers, the discussants, the participants uh, uh, of this session. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you for your kind words and addressing all the speakers about the remarks they have made. And we look forward to continued cooperation. In fact, uh, of course, uh, the Ministry of Commerce always has the pleasure of working with you. But DCCI also has been cooperating with a good office with your kind support. At this point of time, after nearly 90 min minutes, actually, sorry, um, 120 minutes. Uh, it may be an honor for a chief guest, but it's also very tiring because he has to sit through the whole event and listen to all the individual speakers. 
and then have the patients to listen to them and address them. So, but however, we are delighted to have our chief guest today, the Honorable Secretary of the PMO. I also want to personally thank him for being able to help us uh, coordinate this uh, Bangladesh Trade Investment Summit. I still remember uh, last month I ran after him to New York. That's all we need to do this and we need to put this show together. So thank you, Honorable Chief Guest. You had a role in this summit as well uh, to help Bangladesh, uh, the Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and the Ministry of Commerce uh, put up the show together. And this is also a sign of how the public-private partnership uh, working in tandem with the government uh, is still uh, has good hope in this country. And we tried to highlight all the success stories and our honorable guest of uh, our guest of honor, he mentioned today that the success stories in Bangladesh needs to be highlighted. They need to be our brand ambassadors. And we have been trying to do this. And today is the fifth session of the Bangladesh Trade and Investment Summit. In the last few sessions, we have had foreign investors from different regions sharing their success and why Bangladesh is an attractive economic destination. So without further ado, I would humbly request uh, all our uh, respected audience uh, to uh, listen to the valued remarks of the Honorable Chief guest today, Honorable uh, PMO Secretary, Mr. Mohammed the Pazir Hosemiya. Sir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you and good morning. Uh, I know how difficult it is that this uh, how a, a weekend morning could be so burdensome. Uh, this is a good example. Uh, so it, it could be a very funny uh, morning adda today. But uh, all the speakers, the panelists, uh, they have made this program so heavy. So I'm, I am uh, really, uh, I don't know how should I uh, speak because all the issues I have jotted, I have brought in mind, had been told by uh, Barrister Nihat Kabir and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Nasim Manjur, uh, and also uh, uh, our uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Masur Riyaz. So uh, I would like to start with uh, addressing my distinguished colleague, uh, a special guest, Ms. Fatima Yasmin, Secretary Yardi, uh, a respected uh, guest of honor, Mr. Ito Naoki, Ambassador, uh, uh, of Japan in Bangladesh, uh, Mr. Rizwan Rahman, President, uh, DCCI, distinguished panelists, guests, and all the participants. Uh, just, I'd like to bring you an information from the World Bank. As you know, Bangladesh uh, had been uh, uh, passing, uh, we, we had sometimes uh, backward, we had sometimes forward, we had sometimes uh, staggered situation in Bangladesh. Just I would like to bring to you notice uh, from a, a World Bank reference that in 1971-72, the per capita income was uh, $94.38. You, you can see that in 1974-1975, it was $277.57. It means uh, it is uh, 300 times in three years. Uh, the per capita income uh, 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 was uh, uh, to that end. And again, the per capita income from 277 decreased to 278.79. And again, I would like to bring to your notice that from 2008-9, it was $758. Now, 2021, it is uh, $2,227. So I, I just referred it just to remember that how uh, Bangladesh uh, uh, started its journey and how the military intervention, the non-political uh, entity uh, all uh, hindered our progress. So uh, what I would like to say that uh, Mr. Nasim Monju has really raised some pertinent issues that cross cuts, uh, the trade, the investment, the value chain, uh, the trade barriers, uh, in fact, the all the uh, uh, covering all the industrial climate, we are very aware from the governments. We know these are the pertinent issues that we should address immediately. Uh, but what I would like to say that Yes, uh, uh, our journey towards uh, development, towards a, uh, towards a good infrastructure, 
you know, uh, that has been a, a that that has been a very a very big issue for for this present government. And you know, we uh, what Bangladesh is now the natural gateway between Asia and South Asia uh, within a very very strategic location. So, given the situation today's uh, discussion, Asia and Pacific and Bangladesh harnessing economic potentials. This is really a very uh, important subject. And, and you see uh, what uh, Mr. Manju said that Bangladesh, Asia is the new uh, economic front, I'd rather say. Uh, and Bangladesh is a part of it in, the, uh, in this 21st century. And Bangladesh is uh, really, we are poised to transform, uh, uh, transform in many areas uh, we, we would like to become a powerful uh, economic partner. We want to be uh, very uh, progressing globally with commendable achievement uh, over the uh, past decades. So despite even, you know, that despite the COVID-19 and we are vulnerable to natural calamities, disasters, 50,000 uh, people lost their houses in every uh, monsoon. So you know, uh, given the situation, uh, Bangladesh uh, certainly, with the help of the private sector, we are moving forward. It's because you know what is really taking place in Bangladesh. But I would just like to focus on some of the areas that you have mentioned that uh, uh, we we are really we are really meaningful for a sustainable and inclusive growth for. If you look that uh, we have not only working on only business or investment or infrastructure, we are also trying to uplift the life standard of the most, most vulnerable people, people who are beyond the threshold of the poverty level. Uh, we are giving them housing. We are giving them shelters. We are giving them free medicine. We are giving them schooling. Uh, we are uh, 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 giving them skills, training, and the uh, entrepreneurship also. So uh, I think that while this, uh, uh, the growth of the country uh, will elevate the, the country to the desired middle income status and ultimately to that of a developed country, you know our five-year five, eight, five year plan. If we go through it, uh, we have focused on attaining the target of becoming a developed country 2041. This is a real, real target. Previously, we, we did not have any target. Previously, we always had our program on poverty alleviation. Now we have our program on prosperity, on infrastructure, on development, on business. So, so you, you, the business people who are here, you really know that uh, the efficiency, uh, yes, you may ask for our efficiency. You may ask for some of the uh, uh, business environment, but while you, we are talking about managing so many factors in Bangladesh, other than the business, other than the trade and investment, how difficult it is uh, to manage 160 million or 70 million people. So uh, we, yet we are uh, uh, harnessing our effort in uh, energy efficiency and sustainable infrastructure. That is very important. Now we are talking about sustainable infrastructure. It is not about the only after every two years we'll go for maintenance and all these things. We are working on it. We are also uh, providing access to basic services. Uh, and we are also now, we, we have to look on the green and decent jobs, a skill job. That is why government has, you know, National Skills Development Authority. I, I think the business people will be very much happy to see what development has taken place in NSD in, in three or four months. You will see that how the, we are uh, selecting the private sector. They will find out the skilled people. Uh, we, will have a, we don't have a face-to-face -face connection with the, uh, uh, with the certificate holders. They will come online. They will get their certificate and even we, we are providing some special training for them. So they really, and I have, we have the, some of the skill sectors we have uh, find out. And you know, whenever we talk about uh, industrious competitive workforce, you know better than me, then we offer very well-educated, highly adaptive and industrious workforce. Uh, yes, and certainly with a, uh, as uh, we have many, uh, uh, I, I would rather say, 
people from outside Bangladesh, they're joining us. I would rather, for them, I would rather say that we have the competitive ways and salaries uh, in this region. I would not say cheap labor. I would rather say competitive labors. Uh, so uh, we have the uh, youthful group uh, for engagement and the labor force are working towards developing its skill set to meet uh, the global standard. And whenever we are talking about a strategic location or regional connectivity and worldwide access, really we are located next to India, China, and Asian countries. And the economic corridors in the South and Southeast Asia region, such as uh, BCIM, if you talk about BIBM, are taking, are taking tangible shape and becoming a hub of opportunity for Bangladesh. And Bang Bangladesh is gradually integrating into the global value chain, which you have mentioned time and again, uh, um, uh, hence making it important for the country to be recognized as an uh, investment destination, which will also attract global attention. So you have, some of you have mentioned the strong local market and growth. Uh, in addition to the country's global presence in terms of export potential, the domestic market of the population of 160 million uh, with this uh, rising per capita and the brand consciousness is also drawing foreign investors to view Bangladesh as an uh, attractive uh, uh, investment location. I will not talk about uh, low cost of energy or, uh, uh, yes, uh, we, we, sh we should talk about proven export competitiveness. And Bangladesh enjoys the tariff-free access to the European Union, Canada, and Japan uh, in RMG sector. So in European Union, Bangladesh enjoys 60% of RMG market share and is the top manufacturing exporter. In the advent of LDC graduation, Bangladesh is focusing on trade diversification based on non-traditional markets. Uh, adequate incentives are offered to uh, encourage uh, export in these areas. So what I would rather focus that, uh, given the situation we have, uh, 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 the programs, you, you know better that we have the uh, macroeconomic stability, I would not raise it, or the cash incentives, or the uh, uh, some of the uh, great achievement. Uh, Bangladesh has, um, I would rather say, some uh, comparing to South Asian regions, we have some generous incentive packages. So what I would rather say that um, uh, in this morning that uh, we should, uh, we, the private sector, you are the engine of growth. You are uh, leading us. You are the uh, people who are really uh, catering uh, our uh, services. In fact, uh, you are providing jobs. Uh, you are making investment. Uh, you are uh, even uh, with the changing of the time, uh, you, you, you are coming up with uh, innovations. So I think that government is... Uh, really, really uh, happy to work with the private sector. And in recent times, you have shown that uh, our Honorable Prime Minister, uh, sh uh, even the, this, uh, this summit, the Dhaka Chamber and the Commerce Minister, this was almost about to we, from our side, we could not manage them, but the Prime Minister was uh, so keen that she said no, that she will take part in this program. And uh, she is now already, all, everywhere she's, talk, she's talking about diversification. She's talking about new market. She is talking about that how the governments, we are protecting governments, but we have to protect some other sectors also, like the governments. It's not only the governments, uh, other, other sectors should be supported. So uh, I think we are poised in a very, very, uh, comfortable position under the leadership of the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. And uh, uh, yes, there are many challenges. Yes, uh, you, you, you can suggest what Bangladesh should do. We'll welcome you. As our uh, EID Secretary has already mentioned, really we are working hard under six subgroups uh, after the LDC graduation. What should we do? We are really working hard and uh, we are uh, making uh, intensive uh, cooperation with the uh, UN bodies uh, and the other partners. And what you have suggested is very important that jointly we should, after LDC graduation, not as individual Bangladesh, jointly as SARC, as LDC uh, partners, we, sh we should move on uh, uh, on maintaining the, uh, the benefits, the, the um, uh, support we, we have been uh, enjoying. That should be, should be continued. 
So with this, uh, I hope that uh, this uh, this uh, program, I mean this web webinar uh, in this morning, uh, uh, would be a successful one. And I'm really happy that our business colleagues they have brought so many issues. So we can write books on their uh, issues that they have raised. Really, I'm impressed, and I hope that uh, our uh, communications, uh, both formal and in, in, informal, it will be continued. Special thanks to M Ambassador Ritonauki. Uh, he is also very keen on Bangladesh. I have found everywhere. He is very vocal on Bangladesh issues. So it is a great uh, privilege for us to have him with us all the time. So with this, I would like to uh, conclude and thank DCCA and <coughs> uh, Ministry of Commerce for arranging this webinar. And I hope that after this uh, uh, webinar, things would be lighter for us. We will have a good morning at the, in this weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your kind words. In fact, uh, rather you spoke on behalf of the private sector than the private sector itself. And like you said, the honorable uh, ambassador, in fact, he's an honorary Bangladeshi. He speaks for Bangladesh, he brands Bangladesh in the global stage. So definitely we are thankful for your support and uh, all the distinguished speakers, my uh, sincere apologies uh, for disturbing you on a Friday for two hours and 15 minutes and uh, all the time dedicated from the chief guest and the special guest and the guest of honor. But this goes to show that how the success story of Bangladesh working in tandem, the private sector working in tandem with the government will show us the way forward. And the prime minister herself said, which the chief just repeated, that 81% of the uh, eight five-year plan will be achieved by the private sector, which means 19% will come from the government. So of course, the government will give us the right direction and we will spearhead the country, uh, connecting it to the economy of tomorrow. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much.